Um, but we were seeing people have their blood pressures come down very quickly. They would, they would have a more typical omnivorous diet and they would switch to almost exclusively or exclusively plant-based and their blood pressures, their high blood pressure would come down. And in fact, oftentimes two weeks after they would start eating this way, I would get a phone call, a message that's, you know, patient so-and-so is lightheaded now. Ah. And, and what that was, was that they were healing themselves so much. They didn't need as many blood pressure lowering pills. So we started peeling off blood pressure lowering pills. Season three of the Plant Strong podcast explores those Galileo moments where you seek to understand the real truth around your health and dare to see the world through a different lens. This season, we honor those courageous seekers who are paving the way for you and me. So grab your telescope, point it towards your future, and let's get Plant Strong together. Our 10th anniversary Plant Stock celebration is online and on sale. Grab a friend and join us virtually from September 8th to the 12th as we honor all the progress that's been made over the last decade with the science, with the food, and with the movement as a whole. It is nothing short of phenomenal what has happened. This will be the perfect way to invite that family member who desperately needs a green leafy intervention to come take a drink from the fire hose and learn everything they can about the why and the how of plant strong living. And in honor of our 10th anniversary and as part of my mission to reach as many people as possible with the good news about plants, group tickets are just $10 a piece when you buy five. 10 bucks gets you access to life-changing information to help start or strengthen your plant strong journey. Our lineup this year includes the ultimate Brock stars. Can you say T. Colin Campbell, Caldwell Esselstyn, Dr. Michael Greger, Dr. Michael Clapper, Christy Funk, Will Bolshewitz, the Shurzais, the list goes on and on and on. Don't miss out. Visit plantstrong.com slash plantstock to sign up today. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Plant Strong Podcast. I'm your host, Rip Esselstyn. And I'm going to call this episode with Dr. Robert Osfeld, who's a cardiologist at Montefiore Hospital in the Bronx. I'm going to call this the miracle at Montefiore because what he has done at Montefiore and the example that he is setting there is truly, it is miraculous. He is the director and the founder of the Preventive medicine cardiac wellness program at Montefiore. He he went into medicine because he didn't want to make little changes in people's health. He wanted to make radical transformative changes in people's health. And he realized that the the approach and the paradigm that he had learned was doing just that. It was making little, little, little gains. And when he stumbled on plant-based nutrition, tried it out for himself, he realized that this was the answer that he was looking for with his patients as well, and the results speak for themselves. He was also able to get the hospital to serve plant-based food for people recovering from a heart procedure, which is absolutely phenomenal. Um, This is a man who is the real deal through and through. He has got his MD from Yale University, Masters of Science in Epidemiology at Harvard, and then went on to get his degree in his specialty of cardiology. But this man is fascinating. What he's doing is spectacular. And I can't wait for you to hear all the great things that Dr. Robert Osfeld is doing 
at Montefiore. Let's take it away. So, Dr. Robert Osfeld, uh, it is so fantastic to have you on the Plant Strong podcast. I can't believe that it's taken three years to, to get you on, but here we are. Uh, are you in New York right now? I am in New York City. Uh, it's great. And it is such an incredible honor to be here with you and your audience. I love, love the work that you're doing, your family's doing. It's just an incredible inspiration. Uh, it's terrific to be here. Yeah, uh, well, thank you, um, Robert. So I want to talk to you about the miracle that you have worked at Montefiore. Am I pronouncing that right? Is it Montefiore? Yeah, yeah that's great. Montefiore. Perfect. Okay. All right. And Montefiore, because to me, you have worked miracles. Before we talk about the miracles that you've worked there, I want to backtrack for a sec. And I think it's important. And, you know, you've been a speaker at our plant stock event in the past. And to me, you have a really compelling and riveting kind of journey that, that kind of launched you into medicine. Um, and I, I'd love if you could share with our audience what inspired the, first of all, the journey into medicine, and then secondarily, uh-huh. um, and, and I, I want to pepper you with some questions, but sure. then why your interest in plant-based? Got okay. it. Yeah. Well, uh, so thank you. And the... Um, the reason that I got interested in medicine is because when I was a young kid, I had two brothers who died from an incurable disease. And so ever since I was a young kid, I'd been interested in medicine and health. And that is what led me to become a physician. I, I, you know, from the time I even, I think was in high school, I was pretty much on that path. Do you know what, what was those, what were the incurable diseases that your, your brothers got? Is it something that's well-known or very it's, rare? It's pretty well-known. It's these, it's called Tay-Sachs and it is uh, not uncommon in French Canadian populations and in Ashkenazi Jewish populations. And I'm an Ashkenazi Jew. Um, and so there, to my knowledge, remains no cure for it, mm. uh, but you know, there's, re- there's all kinds of research going on in the area. Um, and so there's growing hope. And basically, you're missing um, an enzyme. And it, um, my understanding of it is probably too simplistic, but you have an enzyme that controls kind of fatty tissue, the amount of it in your brain, and we all need a certain amount, but you're missing an enzyme in Tay-Sachs and that tissue, fatty tissue just grows and grows and slowly takes over the brain. There's no cure for it. You slip into a coma and you die. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, uh, my brother, uh, Daniel, uh, died when I was seven. He was about a little under four. Um, And uh, definitely, you know, some of the memories I have, I don't know if they're stories that I heard or pictures. And some of them are definitely my own personal memories. Um, And my brother, Michael, lived a much shorter period of time. Uh, I don't have memories of him, uh, but I have memories of my brother, Daniel. And, uh, you know, it was, um, uh, I look at their uh, part of what I get to do with preventive cardiology and plant-based nutrition as um, part of their legacy and our program as part of their legacy to try to help people be healthier and and their lives are an inspiration to me. And we used to have a conference, which we had for about three years on preventive cardiology, plant-based nutrition based at Montefiore that your father uh, spoke at, and we were honored to, to host him. And, uh, you know, it's been on hold now because of COVID, but we had a a, a Daniel and Michael Osfeld Memorial lecture as part Mm -hmm. of that um, conference. So I, I look at our work, which is very much inspired by uh, your family, your father, you, uh, as part of the legacy of my brothers. Do you have any other siblings? I do. I have a younger brother, Scott, who uh, is doing really well as uh, three kids and he's plant-based. And I remember many, many years ago, I brought over like almond milk or something to his home and he kind of 
<laughs> gave me a look and laughed a little bit. And now he is plant-based. So right. it was a cool evolution. Good, 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 good. Okay. So, all right. So the, your brothers and really inspired you to go into medicine. Um, and it's amazing the legacy that you're, you know, that you've, you're doing for them. Um, so uh, let's talk for a second about your interest in plant-based, but before we do, I really want to share with people your education, because I think that that's really important. So your undergraduate work was at university of Pennsylvania, right? Then you went to uh -huh. Yale for your degree in, in medicine. And then you went to Harvard, if I'm not mistaken, to get your master of science in epidemiology. Is that correct? Yes. Right. Right. Um, and then at some point you decided you're going to go into cardiology. Why cardiology? Well, um, I'd always been interested in the physical exam and the heart. I kind of read like an anatomy class and in medical school, I, I just seemed to like the heart kind of interests me the most of the different body parts. But, and so I'd always had that in the back of my mind. And then when I went up to Boston to do my you know, residency in general internal medicine, like during that time, it's like a three year period of time, you kind of decide if you want to do a subspecialty, like, a, like an internist is sort of like a general pediatrician for adults. And sometimes an internist will then specialize in the kidney or in an organ system, the kidney, the lung, the heart. Uh, so the heart doctors are cardiologists. So during the residency is when you kind of like have to apply for fellowship and you kind of formalize it. And so um, I'd always had an interest in the area. And I remember I was doing this elective because I was ultimately deciding between endocrinology being a, like a hormone doctor, like thyroid and testosterone, things like that and cardiology, because both of them really intrigued me. And so I'm doing the endocrinology elective and I walk into a patient's room and suddenly the patient flips into an abnormal heart rhythm. Um, you know, and I'm the only one there. So of course I'm dealing with it. And I realized that I enjoyed taking care of the abnormal heart rhythm more than I enjoyed taking care of the hormone issue. Right. So I'm like, well, that, that's a sign, that means something. So one thing led to another, um, and I became a cardiologist. <laughs> yes, you did. And, and uh, did you immediately come out as a cardiologist at Montefiore? Uh, so I, I did all my training up in Boston. And then when I yeah. finished all of that, um, my family is in the greater New York area. And I always knew that I wanted to come back closer to home. So I luckily found a position at Montefiore. Um, which is in the Bronx. And one of the things about Montefiore that was really appealing to me is that it, there's a, a lot of medical need in the area. There, like, I think New York State has something like 50 counties and Bronx in terms of health is last 50th. And, it, and it's not even close to like 49. Wow. It might be the least healthful inner city in the whole US. I, it's a title no one wants. Um, I guess it depends on how you define things, but it, there's a lot of medical need there. And there's a very large indigent patient population. And I wanted to use, uh, you know, my training, the legacy of my brothers to, you know, help people in need. And so um, I wound up at Montefiore to, to work as a cardiologist. So in 2003, finished up fellowship, moved down to New York City, and started working. And are you, so you're a cardiologist there and what kind of cardiologist are you there? Are you, cause there, there's a lot of different cardiologists, correct? Or you're absolutely right. There's all kinds of ways to slice and dice it and make it extra complicated sounding. Yeah. So you could be a non-invasive cardiologist which is what I am. And that generally means you see patients in clinic, you see patients in the hospital, you do, you read ultrasound pictures of the heart, maybe stress tests. There are electrophysiologists, another kind of cardiologists that do heart rhythm disorders, pacemakers, defibrillators. There are invasive cardiologists that put in stents and yeah. um, other things. Now there's a whole other area in cardiology now, like structural cardiologists that do fancy valve procedures where they go in through an artery and uh, replace valves without open heart surgery. It's really unbelievable. Yeah. the advances that are happening. It's incredible. 
So I personally am a non-invasive cardiologist and um, about 80% of my time is seeing patients and about 20% of my time is various academic pursuits, whether it's uh, teaching, uh, doing research, uh, starting initiatives, programs. Um, so that's my role at Montefiore. Well, well your, your role at Montefiore is you're the founder and director of the preventive medicine, right, or cardiology, uh, which, which, I mean, when did you, let's back up, backtrack for a sec. So you're a, car, you're, you're a non-invasive cardiologist at Montefiore, but I'm assuming when you started in 2003 that you didn't know anything about a plant-based diet. Is that right? You're 100% correct. I was always really interested in prevention and I did like yeah. a year of preventive research during my fellowship and I got to work with great, great people, but I really learned almost nothing about diet, almost nothing about nutrition. And like when I was done, I kind of knew that a Mediterranean style diet was pretty good, but I couldn't really define it. Um, and that was really it when it yeah. came to diet. And so when I came down to Montefiore, that's what I kind of knew. And then I would encourage patients to eat more of a Mediterranean style diet um, and, you know, do procedures and medications and things as, as necessary. And then people, you know, people got a little bit better, but there wasn't like any kind of, there wasn't transformational change. And so I was a little bummed about that. I'm like, you know, I didn't go into medicine just to like move the needle a teeny bit. Right. Uh, so that was a, that was a real bummer for me. And I remember one it was like one weekend early on, I'm on call and I'm sitting in the hospital it was like a Sunday or something. And I'm like, you know, it just seems like the only people in our division who are really saving people are the invasive cardiologists who put in stents at three in the morning for a giant heart attack. Yeah. And it's wonderful that they can do that. I'm like, there's gotta be more. There has to be other ways to prevent this stuff. And certainly the medications and, and the minimal degree of lifestyle change that I was espousing then is helpful, but it, was, it wasn't really, people just, the, the progression to additional disease, another stand, heart failure, um, another admission to the hospital for heart disease just kept on going. Yeah. So I was getting like this illusion. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and so, and so who, who introduced you to plant-based? Yeah. So a friend of mine, she handed me uh, Colin Campbell's book, The China Study. And so at the same time, I was also running cardiology grand rounds at Montefiore. And that's kind of like uh, a big weekly academic talk that the whole division goes to. It's kind of an important lecture and you, you invite all kinds of leading uh, academicians. So, I'm not, so she hands me this book, The China Study. And she's like, you're gonna like this. I'm like, okay. So, you know, I'm a myopic cardiologist and there's a small section in the middle that's about cardiology. So of course I just go there first. And I started reading about, you know, the plant-based diet and the work of, of your dad. And I'm like, wow, this is really amazing. Like I, I the so degree- you didn't, So, so you, um, you didn't immediately poo-poo it. You were like, oh, yeah. there might be something to this. Yeah, yeah, I definitely did not immediately poo-poo it at all. I'm like, wow, this is super impressive. And I mean, I had to learn more about it, obviously, but I, I was, I mean, I just hadn't, those kinds of patient turnarounds, I had not seen. Um, and so, and that very much aligned with my proclivity toward prevention. Yeah. So I'm like, wow, this seems great. And I was fortunate at the time to be running the car cardiology grand round. So I, I had the opportunity to invite all kinds of speakers in this space in. So, you know, we were honored to host your dad um, and other, and Dr. Campbell and other people in this space as well. I think we had Dr. Willett. Um, and anyway, so, um, and I, it was also had a double edged, another motivation was to sort of like hammer it into the cardiology faculty as well. So I got to learn more and then I got to expose all of our faculty, our fellows and the various other trainees coming through cardiology to this information. So which, is, was, which is brilliant on your part because otherwise they're hearing it just from you. And, you know, it, 
I mean, I would imagine that an invasive cardiologist is not going to be too receptive to this information. Yeah, it remains an uphill climb in some some portions of medicine. But, you know, like, I'm sure you see it for yourself. But as it's gotten, it's become an easier and easier sell. Yeah. You know, certainly as society has changed, you know, that helps move the needle. Um, you know, the American College of Cardiology guidelines, which we can get into a little more, have definitely moved the needle way more toward plant-based nutrition. So it's, it's an easier sell now. But back then, this we're talking like 2006, 2007, maybe. Oh, yeah. It was, it was harder. And yeah. like, I mean, I remember, so I guess I'm fast forwarding, we'll back up a second. Like, so I'm yeah. a, you know, I become plant-based cardiologist around then, and we could talk about that a little bit, but I'm like, I'm looking around New York City, right? Nine million people. And I, obviously I don't know everybody, but I, I didn't know a single other plant-based physician in all of New York City. It's like 9 million people. The closest yeah. one was your dad. I mean, the closest physician doing it was your dad in Cleveland. I'm like, I have to, this, this can't possibly be. And of course, very soon after that, I got to know Dr. Michelle McMacken. Yeah. Um, but, and, and now there's a whole plant posse all kinds of plant-based uh, people. No plant <laughs> there, there, there is, well, you were, you were, you got in during basically, you know, the medieval times for the most part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah when it, when it wasn't really wasn't a thing, it's, it's nutty now. I mean, you know, we, we all know of Dr. Kim Williams at, at, at Rush and what he's done there as the president of the American college of cardiologists. And uh, what I think that I've read that, on his staff of cardiologists, they're 23 or 24 are now plant-based. Yeah, it's something amazing. He's done, he's done great work. His words are more influential than mine. I don't have 95% uh, plant-based faculty. <laughs> right, but, and then, you know, I, I love his, his quote, which is something like, you know, there's two types of cardiologists, right? Those who are vegan and those who have yet to read the data. Yeah, uh, it's a great quote. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I'd love for you to share with, with our audience. You've said that this is, this is probably the most powerful form of medicine that you know of outside of, you know, some sort of an acute injury that, you know, needs to yeah. be healed like a gunshot wound or something like that. Can you, yeah. can you speak to that? Like you, you, you yeah. eat this way to, to heal your heart and, and what happens as, as what are some of the bonuses that happen when you start eating this way? Sure. So, I mean, yeah, the kinds of benefits that we see are, are tremendous. And so, um, you know, I, I became plant-based and, and uh, you know, I, I started to eat this way myself as well, because I'm like, well, if it's going to be good for patients, you know, presumably it'll be good for me also. So I'm like, why not do that? Um, but for our patients, the First, it was, you know, kind of anecdotal because we were just starting out and getting our feet wet, but we were seeing patients who, now mind you, these, you know, we're also using medications and procedures when necessary. I mean, those things are also important. It's really all of the above to yeah. protect people. Um, but we were seeing people have their blood pressures come down very quickly. They would, they would have a more typical omnivorous diet and they would switch to almost exclusively or exclusively plant-based and their blood pressures, their high blood pressure would come down. And in fact, oftentimes two weeks after they would start eating this way, I would get a phone call, a message that's, you know, patient so-and-so is lightheaded now. Ah. And, and what that was, was that they were healing themselves so much. They didn't need as many blood pressure lowering pills. So we started peeling off blood pressure lowering pills and actually like, Sometimes if they call the primary care doctor who may not know as much at the time about plant-based nutrition, they would tell the patient to go back to eating how they were before to have more salt. I mean, it was like 180. <laughs> oh my God. Anyway, so we, so we would see that. We would see cholesterol fall a lot. And I usually wouldn't recheck it for like three months because like I wouldn't you know, see them or wouldn't check it like a week later. But after like three months, we would see LDL, bad cholesterol, not uncommonly come down 20, 30% yeah. in people, which is great. And that's kind of like the same level that you would see with a low dose statin. And 
Mm. You know, there's randomized control data to support that. Dr. Jenkins' portfolio diet study, where he took people and had them on a high fiber plant based diet and also on a low dose of a statin, and the LDL cholesterol fell to a similar degree. Um, and also, I should say, in terms of high blood pressure, there's randomized control data, the DASH, the Dietary Approach to Stop Hypertension data, which is basically a typical Western diet versus almost a fully plant-based diet, not completely, but way, way more plant-based. And there were significant drops in blood pressure there. So the kind of the anecdotes that I was seeing are backed up by, you know, much more robust kind of information. We would see patients who had angina or, or uh, chest pain or chest pressure, for example, because of cholesterol blockages in the blood vessels that feed their heart with blood. As a cardiologist, unfortunately, we see a lot of that. But over a couple of weeks, their symptoms would start to improve. And you know, sometimes it could take months before it might fully resolve. And sometimes patients didn't require procedures. But you know, we would begin to see turnarounds very quickly in that kind of symptom. Uh, typically, uh, and and uh, uh, you know, certainly there is uh, uh, data to support that. Some of Dr. Ornish's work, where he would in randomized control studies would have patients have over time less angina improvements in um, stress test findings as well, which supported our anecdotal findings. Um, also, we, you know, in men, I would start, people would tell me that their erectile function would improve. And, uh, you know, I had one patient who said that now he is a rock star yeah. in the bedroom. <laughs> I like, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't know what his wife thinks, but that's what she yeah. thinks. Um, and, you know, there's randomized control data to support that too, with a, with a Mediterranean style diet, not fully plant-based, but more, more plant-based. Well, you, you actually, I think it's you that has this quote, and that is the way to a man's heart is through his penis. And I don't know. I, I wish I could take credit for that quote. It's a good quote. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean... Uh, yeah, but but I think that you, and if I'm not mistaken, haven't you started a research study? Yeah, uh, so thank you for asking. So yeah. it hasn't started right now. We're targeting December. We hit a lot of hiccups and hurdles because of COVID. Uh, so we were geared up to go and then, yeah. you know, COVID hit and everything. Uh, so um, we are going to look at the impact of dietary pattern on erectile function in young, healthy men. So we're going to randomize young, healthy men between like 18 and 30 years of age um, to either a couple days of plant-based diet or a couple days of animal-based diet, and then cross them over to the other arm and measure their erectile function with the ridge scan device. Right. Uh, and in, a, in a rigorous way. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, we hypothesize that it will improve with a plant-based diet, but we don't know until we do it. So how, how much of this research study was inspired by the game changers and what Dr. Aaron Spitz did with those collegiate athletes with the Ridges scan? Oh, it's definitely a part of it for sure. And the, um, it was sort of like a whole bunch of moving parts came together at the same time. We were separately having conversations before I even knew about that scene. And, nice. I, was, and I was having conversations with other people. So all kinds of planets, like a line, like Halley's Comet came around or something. Yeah. And boom, it all just came together. And we're very fortunate that Dr. Spitz is going to be one of the co-authors on our study. You know, I, I work with him and we text about it regularly. He's been an incredible source of, of health yeah. and information. Yeah. Yeah. No, he, he, well, he is a rock star in that department. No doubt about yeah. it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Truly. All right, gang. I want to share an Instagram message that I just got. This is from a gentleman. His name is George Lagos. And... Before I do, I want to just share a little side note here. He just happened to be the first customer to spot our new Plant Strong Bross Chilies and Stews inside his local Whole Food Market store that's in Wheaton, Illinois. And he did it. He found it after visiting both downtown Chicago stores to try and find the new products. So he was persevering. He was on the hunt for the new Plant Strong products and really appreciate that, George. He went on to share that he's been Plant Strong since 2019 when he saw my book 
my first book, The Engine 2 Diet, that was being sold at his local Whole Foods store. And at the time, he was in fantastic shape. He was working out six days a week. He weighed a trim, lean, and mean 165 pounds. But guess what? His cholesterol was a staggering 330. And one of the things that I tell people is it doesn't matter how hot your engine burns, you don't burn away cholesterol. It doesn't work, work that way, right? If you want to bring down the cholesterol, you got to bring down the saturated fat, the dietary cholesterol, the animal protein, and you want to be like hammering it with all the fantastic substances, the phytonutrients, the antioxidants that you get in whole plant-based foods. Now, since reading The Engine 2 Diet, he's gone all in and he said that he's not had a drop of oil since he started and his cholesterol is now right as rain and he's never felt better. And that to me is not surprising. And I want to appreciate and thank George for sharing his story and huge congrats on his success. Now, Everybody that's listening, I want you to hear this. This is a participatory lifestyle. This is a participatory sport, meaning anyone that's out there listening, you can achieve these results not by listening to podcasts and not by reading books, although it's helpful, but by engaging with the lifestyle. I mean, you literally have to stick a fork in it and dig in. We want you up to your knees, waist, chest in this lifestyle. And I promise you, you won't regret it. So, kale yeah to George and keep it plant strong. Thanks. Um, and, and just so people understand... As a cardiologist, um, and again, I don't know if this is your quote, but you, it's kind of like the the canary in the coal mine, uh, right, is ED. Can you expand on that? Yeah. So we look at erectile dysfunction as the canary in the coal mine for heart disease. Now, the way people get an erection is, you know, there's a psychological or neurological uh, or physical stimulation. And then you know people can get an erection. And what happens is there's blood flow to the penis, and the artery to the penis where the blood flows in is pretty small. Um, and so by the time there is a blockage in that artery that may limit blood flow into the penis and cause some erectile dysfunction, there are many reasons to have erectile dysfunction. That's one of them, but it's, but that's the most common one. By the time there's a blockage there. It is, it is extremely likely that you have a blockage in the blood vessels in the heart that just has not clinically manifest yet because those arteries are a little bit bigger. And typically erectile dysfunction presents around three to five years before an overt cardiovascular disease. So it really is a canary in the coal mine and a great opportunity for us to intervene with risk factors and lifestyle change. That's fascinating. I never, I never heard that before that it usually precedes the heart disease by three to five years, which in some ways actually, to me, now that, now that I'm hearing this for the first time makes sense because, you know, the, those coronary arteries are about, you know, five times bigger than the erect, than the, um, the artery to the penis. So yeah, that's exactly right. We wrote a review article in the American Journal of Medicine and Dr. Spitz is one of the co-authors on it all about lifestyle and erectile function. We get into you know, why it happens and uh, the impact of various lifestyle changes on erectile function. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna have you and Aaron back after you guys have done this study. How long will it take to do the study? Uh, it probably up to two years. It could be one, it could be one year. We're gonna look at the data after we have 38 people enrolled. Yeah. Um, and we bake that into the statistics. So if we see a significant difference, then we can stop. And that might take us a year or so. But if we don't see a significant difference, then we'll extend it up to about 72 people. And so 
I, I don't know. We'll see how well we do with the, with the recruitment and enrollment. Uh-huh, and stuff. Uh-huh, uh-huh. But, that's, uh, that's fascinating right there. Can't wait, wait to see yeah. the results of that. Um, <laughs> let me ask you this. What, what, what are some of the youngest patients that you see coming into Montefiore that actually have like confirmed heart disease? Do you see anybody like as a teenager with that? Um, so as an adult cardiologist, I tip my, I typically don't really get exposed to people until around the years 18 to 21. Yeah. Um, that's, there's like kind of a vague line. When does childhood start and adulthood begin? But, um, you know, I, we certainly see diabetes and high cholesterol, even in teenagers or younger with obesity now. I mean, that is not uncommon at all, yeah. which is terrible because, you know, we kind of, we can look at a number of these disease processes as like, like area under the curve. Like how long are you exposed to diabetes? How long are you exposed to high cholesterol? How long are you exposed to high blood pressure? And these things add up over time. It's like a a disaster. And so you have problems way earlier in life. Um, And so like the youngest person that I've seen with like a heart attack that hadn't been, you know, sometimes people will use uh, drugs or other substances that can trigger these things. But the youngest person that I've seen with a garden variety heart attack without a genetic predisposition, without any illicit use in their very early twenties. And you know, is that a male or female? It was a male. Yeah. But typically, you know, our, our typical patients are in their 50s, 60s and 70s, but they have been, you know, the seeds for the problem have been growing for a long time. You know, maybe they've been, um, you know, obese for a while and their blood pressure has been too high for a while and their cholesterol has been too high for a while. Maybe not the most ideal lifestyle. And it's, you know, this is definitely not patient blaming at all like society is not built to make the healthy choice the easy choice and certainly there are genetic contributions and social determinants of health and all a very complicated milieu but the seeds of the problem as you know start very very early so in doing in, in doing my research for this i i saw you mentioned in one of your interviews um in Johannes, johannesburg south africa over a 10 year period, just to kind of where they, I think eat predominantly plant-based to see how, what kind of heart disease do they have there? And this one hospital going back 10 years, roughly 40,000, you know, visits a year or 40,000 patients. So a total of 400,000. And I want you to say it, how many people of those 400,000 over 10 years had heart disease, you know, written down? Yeah. So the best is good memory. Like I had, had forgotten about the study by Dr. Burkett. And this was about 40,000 patients a year. It was a more indigenous population, not a Westernized population of people. And they were having their physically active plant-based diet. And I think there may have been 30, 30. No, that's, oh, that's no, that's the number. It was 30, 30 out of 400,000. Yeah, exactly. Over 10 years. And, yeah. And, you know, and, and the, as you know, like you could go to, you know, the Cleveland Clinic right now where your dad is, or you can go to Montefiore right now where I am. And there are more than 30 heart patients on the floor this very second. Exactly. Um, yeah. So, and then it's so interesting. There is this wonderful study um, of the Simone people that was published in Lancet in 2017. And they're an indigenous population out of Bolivia. And they eat mostly a plant-based diet. I think 72% of their, their calories is carbs, 14% animal protein, 14% uh, fat. They're yeah. very physically active and they have the lowest rates of heart disease ever recorded in the medical literature. How, um, how low, how low, like how can you get lower than that? <laughs> well, well, yeah, it's, that's true. But I guess what the, I should say, because uh, they had CAT scans. So it was like very yeah. rigorously assessed as opposed to like maybe somebody misrode it in a chart. So more rigorously assessed with CAT scans and their vascular age is felt to be about 20, 25 years younger than typical Western. Um, So, and, and uh, you know, their diet is largely plant-based. I mean, it's obviously a complicated milieu. They're not exposed to to pollution. They're living much more of an indigenous lifestyle, but it, it just highlights how powerfully lifestyle 
yeah. can impact cardiovascular disease. Well, and, and, and for you as somebody that is, is trained and has a degree in epidemiology, I mean, this is just, you must go, I mean, come on, what more do we need, right? This is so powerful. Exactly. It's sort of, it, it, it's, it's, it's disappointing and, and, and invigorating at the same time because you see yeah. all the potential opportunity and then you see all the headwinds. Uh, so, and, you know, there's all kinds of data that even if people make modest changes, you know, have a few more servings of fruits and vegetables, eat a little less junk food, a little less, a little fewer animal products, that they see all kinds of benefits. So, you know, on an epidemiologic level, we don't have to have perfection be the enemy of good. Right. And if you look at, there's all these dietary studies where if they look at the way people eat um, and, and they say, okay, we're going to define a, a perfect diet. It's not perfect. It's like a handful of fruits and vegetables a day, low salt, you know, low sugar, some whole grains. And some of these studies will say a little bit of fish. And if you... If you have the perfect diet, you know, we'll have five levels. And the, if you're in the highest quintile, uh, that's considered more ideal. And, they, and, they, and in one of the studies, 0.7% of the U.S. achieved the right. ideal diet as defined by that. And like 58% was in the lowest category defined by that. We are not even within 100 miles of eating reasonably optimally uh, in the U.S. There's a really cool study out of, the, out of Framingham, the Framingham Heart Study, which got cholesterol and risk factors on the map. And they looked at, you know, ultra processed food, junk food, like, you know, sugar cereals, chips, stuff like that. And, and shocker, the more you ate, the worse you did. But the thing to me that was super interesting about this study is the average person, there were 3,000 people in this, the average person had seven and a half servings a day of ultra processed foods. I mean, yeah. it's like, what do you have time to eat? How can you eat anything else? You know, it's like, it's we're so far away from ideal uh, that um, we would, so you, there are some serious headwinds. Now, when you see it in the, in the hospital, people, you know, I talked to some of the cardiology fellows and I'm like, hey, when's the last time you saw someone just with lifestyle change, their angina improve, they lose 25 pounds, their cholesterol falls, their diabetes goes away. And they're like, never. Yeah. We don't yeah. see it. And, but we see it regularly, of course, with a plant-based diet. So let's talk about the food for a sec. So what, when I say, or somebody asked you, so Dr. Osfeld, what does a whole food plant-based diet mean? Give me your, give me your just kind of reader's digest version of what that means. To me, it's a minimally processed or, or smartly processed plant-based diet. And so, you know, sugar cookies can be plant-based, uh, can be vegan, but they're not healthy. Um, no one thinks that they're healthy. So to me, a smartly or minimally processed plant-based diet uh, is tons of uh, green leafy vegetables, fruits, other vegetables, herbs and spices, beans, lentils, chickpeas, peas, tofu, baked potatoes, um, you know, for, for many patients, avocado and raw nuts, um, and, and getting rid of the ultra processed foods and you know, getting rid of the animal-based foods, um, particularly processed meat and red meat in, in particular. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if someone is going to go down that path, we, um, you know, we certainly want them to supplement vitamin B12. And I'll also often ask patients to supplement omega-3 as mm -hmm. well, not necessarily for heart health, but for, for brain health, because although you might be able to get ALA, alpha linoleic yeah. acid from hemp seeds, chia seeds, ground flaxseed meal. Not everybody converts that all that well into other omega-3s. So I uh, will often belt and suspender that with an omega-3 supplement. So, so to me, it's a minimally or smartly processed plant-based diet, you know, brown rice and beans, uh, big salad, um, yeah. lots of wonderful options, literally anything that's in your cookbook. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Um, so to me, one of the miracles that you have pulled off at Montefiore is 
and I, I, you correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think that you were the first to make this happen is you now offer your cardiac patients a whole food plant-based meal option uh, as they're recovering. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, it was a really interesting adventure. I don't know for sure if we were the first, we were definitely the first, or at least I think we were the first to have uh, forks over knives playing for free for patients on one of the inpatient channels. I mean, you could watch something else. But we also have it yeah. on the inpatient TVs and it has Spanish subtitles, which is very important yeah. for our patient population. Um, and uh, and it plays just on continuous loop, which is great. So, so kind of the, the story with that is, you know, we, at that time, we, we already had our outpatient program where you, you see patients in clinic going strong. We would help them become more plant-based. We had the Saturday morning sessions modeled after your father's sessions where patients would come with a friend or significant other. And we take a deep dive into the how and why of plant-based nutrition and work with the nutritionist Lauren Graff and RD Lauren Graff on that a lot. And we wouldn't charge patients for it. We would fund it all through donations. There's a very large indigent patient population where I am. And so we wanted to democratize this information. So nice. our outpatient program was going strong, but I would also round in the hospital, you know, for patients who were admitted after a heart attack or for whatever reason they're in the hospital. And I would mention plant-based nutrition. And, uh, you know, I'd go rah, rah plants. And then I'd leave the room and 10 minutes later, dinner served and, you know, it's chicken or something. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> It's totally undercut and it's not working. So we worked with food services and really was a wonderful collaborative effort with, with nutrition and food services and multiple chefs throughout our system to make you know, ethnic, ethnically relevant meals. And we built a plant-based menu. Wow. You know, it's not, it's not five-star Michelin, no. but it is, you know, decent. And um, how long did it take from like when you hatched that idea to where you're actually serving it to the patients. Is it, is that a two year journey? Yeah. 18 to 24 months. Yeah. I mean, that sentence was, took a long time to materialize. Yeah. I remember we would sit down, you know, and like, like, okay, we'd love to have me, let's have some hummus and this or that. And then they'd be like, okay, that's beyond our ability. It's too costly. So we'd have to, you know, revamp it. And so a lot of uh, trial and error um, and then getting it into the medical record system and all this stuff. Uh, but finally it worked and it's been there for a long time now, many years. And it, it is in, we have a medical electronic medical record and you can just go in and click and boom, you can order cardiac plant-based diet, uh, which is great. And it's supposed to, it doesn't always, but it's supposed to come with a handout and you can also watch forks over knives on TV. So now I can walk into a patient's room, go rah, rah plants. We order the, we order the meals. Yeah. Uh, you uh, get the handout, hopefully. And you can put on forks over knives. So now I have my plant-based posse with me. So are you, are you able to keep track of the data? So like, just for example, let's say over the month of uh, June, you had a hundred cardiac patients. How many of those hundred are picking, picking the plant-based option? Well, so I, I don't have that data. I yeah. would love to. So, but the good news is that we are at Montefiore, the physicians or the physician assistants order the meals. And it's not like a patient gets a menu. It's just how it works in our system. So they order the meals. Um, and I keep on pushing to have it be used more and more throughout the system. Right now, the plant-based meals, I think, are offered in three of our hospitals with, you know, that's got to be like 12, 1500 beds. Wow. Um, and, you know, not everybody's getting it. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like herding cats. People come, people go. And we're actually, I've been pushing for this for a while. It hasn't happened yet, but I want to make it the default meal on one of our cardiology floors and have it grow and grow. And the person who runs clinical cardiology is definitely aligned with that. So I'm very hopeful that it will happen, uh, but, it's been, but it's been a great adventure. It's a wonderful resource for us. Uh, and, and it has led to all other kinds of initiatives. Like for example, I make our cardiology fellows have a, there's a little question in their note, their, their consult note template. Yeah. If they ever see a consult in the hospital, they have to ask, does the patient consume at least five servings of fruits and vegetables a day? And the answer is yes, no, deferred. Like if you're intubated and can't speak, you know, it's deferred, obviously. Yeah. And we put that right over the assessment and plan. So for people who read medical notes, they'll know that that's good real estate. So you'll see it. So the point of that is to drill it home, in, it's a simple intervention, but to drill it home to the fellows that it's important. 
to drill it home to anyone who reads the cardiology consult note that cardiology thinks it's important and to drill it home to the patient uh, you know, that their physician thinks it's important. And hopefully, as the years go by and people graduate and they go to different places, it spreads throughout the you know, medical system slowly. And it's totally non-controversial. Like the American Heart Association, World Health Organization, they recommend four to five servings of fruits and vegetables a day. Yeah. So not controversial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you know, following your lead, is this happening all over New York, for example? Um, well, yeah, I mean, uh, this is not our doing, but through PCRM, and we certainly were sharing them on and other groups, you know, Eric Adams, the incredible uh, Brooklyn Borough President, will be the Democratic uh, nominee for mayor yeah. of New York City. Uh, there, I believe in New York State, yes, it's mandated in New York State that a hosp- the hospitals at least offer a plant-based meal. That doesn't for inpatients, and it doesn't mean they have to the patient has to get it, but they at least have to be able to offer it. Wow. And PCRM was involved with that. And they did something similar in California. So th- there's, the needle is shifting. And of course, uh, uh, Eric Adams has been very involved with the city hospital system with Dr. McMacken doing wonderful things at Bellevue. And if he is to become mayor, uh, presumably you- it'll get a lot more attention, a lot more funding and resources. Can you imagine? Yeah, we had, we had uh, Eric on the podcast uh, two seasons ago. And I just, uh, you know, he has a saying that I love. And he says, how goes Brooklyn goes, New York goes, the USA goes the world. Uh, And, uh, you know, with the help of Eric, uh, I think we'll be able to really, really move that needle. Yeah. It'll be really cool. That's that to me, that's, it is so miraculous. So Herculean that you were able to make that happen. And I think it must be a testament to, you know, not only your, 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 your fortitude, but also, you know, the passion and the results that you're getting there. So kudos to you on being such a trailblazer like that. Well, thank you. It's very generous of you to say it was, it was really a a labor of love, you know, wrapped in a pit bull. (laughs) 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 I love that. But uh, yeah, so, well, well, thank you. And, And we were super psyched about our conference and stuff and, yeah, uh, other educational research initiatives too, but you know some of that stuff got stalled by COVID, understandably. Yeah, yeah. Um, what do you think? What do you see with your patients as being like the number one stumbling block, or is it very like person to person? It it definitely varies, but you hit on the the key thing: behavior change. Like we all kind of know that eating more kale is good for us, but getting ourselves to do it is is often a problem. Um, and I think the biggest thing is it's just not baked in, into society. Like we're not geared to be healthy. You know, there's most the food bill, you know, supports to the tune of billions and billions of dollars, not necessarily healthy items in agribusiness. You know, there's tons of fast food restaurants all over the place. There are bodegas that don't necessarily have the healthiest foods. You know, the people around us, because of this system we live in, are not eating healthfully. And so, you know, we may talk about it with patients and then they go home and, you know, like it's just harder. The activation energy is hard Mm -hmm. um, because society is not geared like that. It's harder to find all the fresh vegetables and then maybe maybe you live in a food desert. You know, maybe you don't feel safe walking to the supermarket that's an extra five blocks away. Just just all kinds of, of, of hurdles are in the way of that happening. And you know, that's why we really push that we don't mess, we don't want to have perfection be the enemy of good. And even if patients are able to make some changes, we're super uh, excited about that. But I think the biggest hurdle is that society needs change. Yeah. So and, and that really, to me, you know, resonates with Dan Butner's work with the with the Blue Zones. And as you said earlier in the podcast, you know, we got to we got to figure out a way really as a society to make the healthy choice, the easy choice. Right. So it's not a huge lift. Yeah. yeah I totally, I totally agree. I mean, yeah. that's, that's the key. Yeah. But I mean, and you can, you know, not that this, we don't, I don't necessarily get into this with uh, in the medical world. Uh, but, you know, clearly animal agribusiness creates more greenhouse gases than all transportation combined, which of course includes cars. And, you know, who cares how healthy you are if there's no planet? 
you know, no planet, no hell. So it all, <laughs> it's, it all aligned. It's so true. You know, there's a study that, that, that came out. I, I just got it like two weeks ago. I don't know if you know who Cel- Celeste Rao is, but he started a nonprofit called Climate Healers. And this study, it's in part Stanford and another organization, shows that, you know, the global greenhouse gas emissions em- emitted by animal agriculture aren't 15%, which is basically what all forms of transportation are, aren't 51% as the World um, Health uh, Organization or the World Bank commissioned a report in 2009 called Livestock's Long Shadow. Um, and that came, that showed it was 51%. This latest report shows it's 87%. Oh my it's God. like mind blowing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So again, it's like, you know, as you just said, I mean, we, we, we got to collectively get behind this and get behind this in a hurry. Otherwise, you know, we're kind of doomed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, New York City will be underwater pretty soon. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, not pretty. Not pretty. Yeah. No, yeah. terrible. Yeah. But in the meantime, uh, the miracle at Montefiore, you got to uh-huh. do a, you got to do a book. You got to do it. Uh, yeah. Well, maybe after the erectile function study, like, oh, yeah. I, just, I just don't, I don't know. Every, time, every now and again, I think about it, but like, I don't have, like, my heart isn't there. My passion isn't there for that. You know, it's fun. I like, you know, uh, giving the talks and, and writing yeah. articles and, and, you know, teaching the residents and fellows. And, and my, right now, my passion is there. Maybe after the erectile function study is done, I'll, uh, I'll think I'll revisit the idea of a book yeah and we actually even just launched a podcast called cardio nutrition through the american college of cardiology geared toward cardiologists uh you know about diet so we're hoping to move the needle there is that something that you're hosting yeah wow when did you start it like honestly it launched yesterday (laughs) great (laughs) good Good. Well, that, and is that open to everybody to listen to? It is open to everybody. They are bite-sized. They're like 10 to 20 minute interviews. So they're real quick. And it's like about whole grains and about fats and about uh, protein and about dietary patterns and the, and the guidelines. So it's really meant to be, you know, a bite-sized friendly uh, approach to diet. That's smart. That will hopefully be helpful for patients and, car- and, you know, and cardiologists. That's smart. That's smart. Yeah. Well, I'd love to have you back on and we can talk about TMAO and heme iron and, you know, all those, those things that basically contribute to to heart disease. But I want you to get it back to Montefiore and all the wonderful things you're doing there. But I I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us on the Plant Strong podcast. And, um, you know, I wish you all the best, my Plant Strong brother. Oh, well, thank you. The work you guys are doing is total inspiration. Uh, your father's work is the inspiration for our program um, and all the you know ripple effects thereof. Uh, so thank you, thank your family, thank you for this opportunity, and it's great to connect. Thank you. Hey, sign off with me. Ready? Peace. Peace. Engine two. Engine two. Keep it plant strong. Plant strong. All right. Yeah. I find doctors like Dr. Robert Osfeld to be absolutely so refreshing. And with doctors like him on the front lines, I am optimistic that real change can and will happen in our healthcare system. But the key is we're going to have to pivot from the current focus, which is on sickness, back to health where it all belongs. It's about prevention prevention, prevention. For more information on today's show, simply visit the episode page at plantstrongpodcast.com. And next week, get ready because I speak to the most authentic and compassionate guest that I've ever had the privilege of speaking to. I'm sure that it will leave a huge imprint on you just like it did me and you do not want to miss it. I'll see you then. Thanks.
Thank you for listening to the Plan Strong podcast. You can support the show by taking a quick minute to follow us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Leaving us a positive review and sharing the show with your network is another great way to help us reach as many people as possible with the exciting news about plants. Thank you in advance for your support. It means everything. Have you had your own Galileo moment that you'd like to share? What happened when you stepped into the arena and shed the beliefs that you thought to be true? I'd love to hear about it. Visit plantstrongpodcast.com to submit your story and to learn more about today's guests and sponsors. The Plant Strong Podcast team includes Carrie Barrett, Lori Kordowich, Amy Mackey, Patrick Gavin, and Wade Clark. This season is dedicated to all of those courageous truth seekers who weren't afraid to look through the lens with clear vision and hold firm to a higher truth. Most notably, my parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Anne Kryle Esselstyn. Thanks for listening. This is a man who is the real deal through and through. He has 